Uh, What's our safe word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> safe word. Wooly. If I say, uh, if I can work into the sentence, um, uh, banana rama. But yeah, that the <laughs> banana rama is the safe word. <laughs> we're rolling, so whenever you want to go. Yeah, I thought we were already recording. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm Chris Powell. I'm the host of the Houndsman XP podcast. And we're sitting here interviewing Brent Reeves, and we got Clay Newcomb on the sound. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, the sound, sound man. Yeah, thank, thanks for thanks for agreeing to run our tech. Sound yeah, I'm tech the tech course. guy. You play know, the, play the drum, <laughs> Phil. I'm gonna just make a few little adjustments here. There we, we usually go. don't let sound guy say much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> oh man, no, we're in Arkansas. Glad you're here, man. Are you uh, are you calling this a global Bear Grease global headquarters? This is, this is the Meat Eater South Bear Grease Global Headquarters. There you go. I knew there was a name for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it, I'm glad you guys sat down. Now, you've we, been here before. I have been here before, back when it was the – When uh, it was the Bear Hunting Magazine Global Headquarters. Absolutely. <laughs> I love what you've done with the place. The barn looks great. Mm-hmm. Is there a living quarters up there? And oh, stuff? yeah. Oh, it's nice. There is. Yeah. yeah. When Alexis and I come to town, that's where we stay. Yeah, yeah, it's that's nice. That's good. On a, on a normal – night chris i would have offered for you to say but like i told you today's not a normal day oh, i hear you there's no normal i've got places it, to be in that I, I don't i got places to be anyway clay yeah 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 you, i understand <laughs> there's no normal really i was going to say that newcomb normal is not is a whole different level of normal than yeah anything hmm. else it's 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 different you were about to say weird no okay you uh, yeah i was you're right <laughs> <laughs> you're right well, the reason I, I the reason I wanted to talk to you guys on the podcast is just catch up, see what you've been up to. You guys are obviously enjoying a lot of success with with bear grease, and and you guys love to you guys love to chase hounds. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yes we do. Yeah, that's probably numero uno on the list. Is that right? Oh, is, yeah. is it for you, Brent? It is, man. You know, I retired, Chris. I'm like you. I joined the club, the retired police club. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I say it is. How long? October the 31st was my last day to work. Uh, it, it hadn't sank in long enough with you yet. Well, I've been fighting a kidney stone since the day after I retired Ooh. up until this very minute. So I have really not enjoyed. Still in a fight. <laughs> you should phrase that. I'm in a fight with a kidney yeah, stone. Yeah, I'm in a fight, yeah. And so I haven't really had time to relax. There's been a lot of. It's been some discomfort and doctor's appointments and stuff, but I'm about to get it squared away. A yeah. few months from now, a year from now, you'll be thinking, how did I ever have time to go to work? For real. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when my dad retired, or before he retired, he, he would always make the statement. He said, he said, it's not that I don't like my job. I just don't have time for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're like me, you'll miss the circus. Or you'll miss the monkeys, but you won't miss the circus. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, yep, you'll 100%. miss the monkeys, but you won't miss the circus. Yeah, so. for sure. So, are you still hunting Waylon? I am. How old is Waylon? Waylon the Wonder Hound. Waylon turned four years old on August the 15th. And how's Waylon bred? He I it, never have heard that story. He is out of, um, give me a minute. He's a tree and walker. We'll get it. We'll get that. that Can we? Do you edit anything? No. Give me a. <laughs> give me. Give me a timeout because let's, out, let's I move get... over to Clay <laughs> yeah. and find out what's going on in Clay's world. Because I'm right absolutely drawing a blank. Oh man, this is like not knowing you. You know his birthday. Amateurs. Oh, absolutely. Podcast amateurs. What is it? Say it. Bone collector. Yeah, he's bone a, collector. He's a bone collector, <laughs> yeah, that dog. real unknown dog. I'll, I'll yeah, what you, I'm the sound you've, guy. You've you've probably never, no you, you've probably never heard of him, but yeah. yeah, he is a grandson to Bone Collector. No kidding. Mm-hmm. He huh. is. But let me tell you, when I got him, I'd never heard of him. I'd been out of coon hunting so long, uh, or owning a dog for so long, that I didn't, I didn't know anything about Bone Collector. So a good buddy of mine, Rex Whiting, drives up in my yard one day. And says, I didn't know him from Adam. He just said, man, I see this dog box in the back of your truck. There's only kind of two folks that have dogs in this part of Arkansas. Are you a duck hunter or are you a coon hunter? And I said, well, I actually do both. But I said, I got a coon dog that goes in this box here. I just got him. He says, what kind of dog is he? And I said, well, I got the papers. I'll show you. 
come back here in the backyard. Now, I've never met this guy. I never knew him from I follow for all I know, he was casing the joint to steal stuff when I wasn't there. Right. So we walk in. Which still is undetermined. Yeah, Rex. I talked to Rex, Rex. yesterday. I'm still I'm still wondering about that. But anyway, <laughs> we walk in the backyard, and I hand him the, I go in the house and get the papers. And he said, oh, man, that's a bone collector dog. I said, is that good? He said, that's pretty sporty. Yeah. So, and just through attrition and trial and error, uh, I made a, a pretty decent coon dog out of him. And uh, he gets all the credit, but I had a lot of help from some folks too, you know. But right. He turned. He's a good dog. He's all right. Uh, he's uh So, what is your background, Brent, as far as you know, with coon hunting? You said you hadn't had hounds for a long time. Man, I grew up doing it. I grew up doing it, and and had dogs earlier before I got in law enforcement. Once I got in law enforcement, that that career just absolutely forbade me from. So spending the amount of time to be able Brent's to. Brent's dad was a big coyote man, mm -hmm. you know, fox hunter. Yeah. And had had running walkers. Yeah. Also big squirrel dog men. Yep. Tree dogs. So. And so it, it come from a family. My uncle, my uncle uh, was a coon hunter and had a lot, had some, had some real good dogs. As a matter of fact, he had a, his best dog, and he'll talk about him now. Was a, a tree and walker he had back in the seventies named Willie Nelson. And how? And then, and of course, you, now yeah. I got a dog named Waylon. Yeah. So it was kind of hand in hand. But but I, during my law enforcement career, I still coon hunted with a with a bunch of buddies of mine that had dogs. But mm -hmm. I I didn't have one of my own. So you didn't take a hiatus from it. Per no, se. you still went. I oh, still went, but yeah. just just didn't have a dog of my own, which was something that just when i finally got to the i mean the the knot in the rope of my career at the end of it i was able to start looking into getting me a dog and i looked for six months before i ever went and looked at a dog i talked to people for six months and i looked at pictures and i did this and that and i talked to folks and i found him on facebook marketplace of all things but if you didn't know bone collector it was I mean, just what, a, what sent you the direction of to, to pick up Waylon? They had this this ad came up on Facebook Marketplace for they had a six month old tree and walker and there was a video of it barking at a at a at a coon in a cage and we all know that a poodle will bark at a coon in a right. cage that don't that don't mean anything sure but there was something about that dog and I had looked Chris at, at literally hundreds of dogs in that six months and when I say six months I'm not kidding it was six months. You were obsessed. I was obsessed with looking at pictures and talking to people and calling and texts and emails. And finally, something about that dog appealed to me. Mm -hmm. So I uh, contacted the, the person, turned out it was a young lady, and said, I want to come look at this dog. And uh, I said, I live 45 minutes from where y'all live. She says, well, that address is not right. We moved since we posted that. Now we live in southwest arkansas it was three hours from my house and i said well i've already said told you i'd come to look at it there's something about this dog i want to come see it i want to come look at it mm -hmm. and i drove up there and these folks had were of, of very humble home life there and they obviously were selling the dog out of necessity and the conditions the dog was staying in were subpar to say the least they were they were good folks and they were doing the best they could and so I thought, you know, at the least, maybe I, through divine intervention, I'm here to rescue this dog and get him out of this condition. <laughs> I can get my money back on him because they don't want anything for him. Right. And, you know, he's registered, you know, good-looking hound. He just His confirmation was good. He just looked good. And I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll uh, I'll give you $300. He said, well, I'm just asking 250 I said, well, I got, all I got is 300 I felt sorry for him. Right. Brent does most of his business in three hundred dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> that's from the old three hundred, six hundred, nine hundred, twelve hundred. And so I give her, I give her three hundred dollars, and we're walking to the truck. And I ask her, I said, "Well, has he got a name?" She said, "Yeah, his, his name is Waylon. It's like it's some singer or something. I don't know anything about it." <laughs> and when she said that, I thought, "Wait a minute, now." I mean, because Waylon was that was my that's my guy. You know, yeah. I've always been a big fan of that, and I thought well, maybe I'm. Maybe there's something to this. What's your favorite Waylon song? Oh, I've always been crazy. I've always been crazy. Yeah. But it's kept <laughs> it's me from doing going, what? It kept from me from going insane. Exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how much truth is there as to that, but anyway, we uh I get him home 
And the next, the day I'm bringing him home, they called us from school. That was the day the COVID stuff started. And I had to go to school and get my little girl out of school. It was in March of, what, 2020? 2020. And that's when all that started. So I was working from home. My wife was working from home. My little girl was at home. At night, I didn't have anything to do but take that dog hunting. And that's what kicked it off, man. We were hunting probably, oh, four out of seven nights. Is is your dog out? Maybe. Is You guys, keep keep telling the story, Brian. I'm going to check and see if that's tough. Roger that. So they, I probably don't, let, they probably let my squirrel dog out. So what's happening here, folks, is uh, – <laughs> Chris is making a mad dash. <laughs> uh <laughs> My Chris brought his little Jag Terrier to Arkansas, and he drove a long ways, and so he he had it out earlier. Well, Tim the squirrel dog, Tim the squirrel dog, was out too, and we were worried that the Jag Terrier and Tim would get into a fight because uh, they're both kind of going to duke it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, anyway, Chris just perked up his ears <laughs> and ran out and said. I think my dog's out. <laughs> he had it in a dog box, though. Now that we own Hound, the Houndsman XP thread. What can we do with this? Um, welcome to the Houndsman XP podcast, hosted Have, by Clay Newcomb and all, Brent Reeves. All merchandise is 75% off. Yeah, we're doing a 75% <laughs> off all hats, shirts. Yep. And it's because the and free oil leader changes. of Houndsman XP <laughs> didn't shut his dog box. And Chris will come to your house and change your oil. Yep, Chris Chris Powell will come to your house and change your oil. Uh, man, we're having a big sale at Houndsman XP, Chris. Seventy five percent off everything. <laughs> okay, was was that your dog or my dog? Uh, it was yours. Okay, yeah, but they're the, both the same size, and I got really concerned because uh, he probably depopulate this whole Newcomb Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if he got Pretty over quick. there on those pigs, Chickens. Of mine. Yeah. Pigs. Chickens, pigs, mules. Yeah, he'd have a mule down out in the pasture for sure. He probably would. You know what app I use on my phone more than any other app besides the podcast app to listen to this here podcast? I use Onyx. Onyx Maps is the most comprehensive mapping system for hunters on the market today. I use it all the time. When I was in New Mexico, I was looking at 40,000 acres of ranch that I needed to learn. I flip open Onyx and just start studying, studying the map. When I'm riding trails, I put the tracking app on. It helps me get around in strange country. I could mark water sources, food sources, bear sign, just all kinds of options within Onyx. You need to check out Onyx Maps by going to houndsmanxp.com. Click on the link on our sponsor page. You'll go right to Onyx Maps, and when you check out, enter the code HXP20, and you will get 20% off of your order. Know where you stand with Onyx. Did he do all right? Has he got the hang we, of this we podcast? Took over, we yeah. took yeah. over hosting for a few minutes there. You may yeah. want to. You're probably uh, going to want to proofread this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you don't. Just let it go. It's all good. <laughs> but anyway, we hunted. I hunted him a lot, man. I did, yeah. There was nothing else to do, you know, and I wasn't. We couldn't. There wasn't nowhere. Everything was closed. There was nowhere to go. We, wouldn't, we couldn't hang out. So when uh, Alexis and Bailey, my wife and little girl, went to bed, me and Waylon went to the woods. There you go. That's and what it takes to make them. Man, I tell you, shoe leather, burning shoe leather. And that dog, you know, I talked to my friends and and older hunters, more experienced hunters, and I said, this is what's going on. Okay, do this. Uh, or just let the dog, just ha- let him have an opportunity. And that was the best thing that I did was taking him out and exposing him and letting him find out his purpose you know because he had drive and if you've got a dog that wants to get out and go you know you can pretty well square away everything else but i mean you can't get you can't make one that's exactly right and it's been my experience anyway so i i did i did what they told me you know to the letter i took him out there and the opportunities that and gave him opportunities to do right and when he did right he got praised for it when he did wrong he got corrected and we just did that continuously four and five nights a week to the point to now where 
I haven't been hunted in he ain't been hunted in a month because I've been dealing with all this other stuff. Right. But if but if we go tomorrow night, I I'm when I cut him loose, I'm confident if there was a hot track somewhere close, he's gonna find it. We're gonna tree a coon. How involved were you in the uh, the coyote fox hunting stuff? Uh, as an observer, now my dad was he was it. You know, when my at my dad's funeral, I had a man from Louisiana that I had never met come up and told me he said son you have never met me and there he said if you look around here there's probably 400 people at this funeral he said but as long as there are coyote dogs and men that hunt them your daddy will never die because he is known forever so i was what kind of dogs did he have brent running walkers walkers. Uh, yep and absolutely hated a july dog and the best and the best one he ever had he'll tell you was a july yeah. Yep. <laughs> but he hated him. But he hated him. Classic yep. Reeves. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Oxym- oxymorons <laughs> or heavy on the moron. Well, people, a lot of people don't know this story about me. You know, I, I always say friends don't let friends hunt walkers. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the best dogs I ever had was a walker. Yeah. You know, he was a he was a um, just common bred walker out of Kentucky. Yeah. And uh, when I was getting married, the second time. Uh, I'd learned some things from my first marriage, and so I thought, I'm going to send some hounds down the road here <laughs> he, uh, just to get off to a good start the second time around. Sure. And uh, uh, he went on to to be a heavy hitter, won the PKC state race, or, or was placing real high. He was a contender for it. I don't think he won it. He was a contender for it. Made him Grand Knight champion. I mean, he was just he was he was a nice dog, and he was mm-hmm. a trim walker dog. Yeah, had half a white face, ugly as, built like a tank, beautiful built dog. But most people saw him like, and it just hated his looks. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, I like uh, him ugly. <laughs> yeah, like they're him. easy to find. So does Brent. Yeah. <laughs> you seen the picture of Waylon? No, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding, Brent. Yeah, here we go. I'm kidding. It's yeah. two against one. Yeah. So I want to come back to the. I want to come back and get more on that coyote fox okay. hunting story in sure. a minute. Clay, how did you get involved in hounds? So I don't. I don't know that my we've dad, ever drilled into this. Th- so my my grandfather. This is a picture of him right here. Lewin Nukem was a bird dog man. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was the quintessential Southern bird dog trainer. N- not professionally. He didn't. He didn't train dogs for money. He was a pastor, but he, from the time, I mean, the whole, my whole life and decades before I was born, he would have had, he he, he would have had dogs that he was trained, big bird dog, man. And, mm-hmm. and I had bird dogs when I was young. He gave me some started dogs. I got a bird dog when I was in the sixth grade and we had a few quail and hunted. I, I, I like to say that's where I got the love for hunting with dogs Yeah, was with bird dogs. Quail were essentially gone by the time I got into it, and and it didn't take me long to realize that quail hunting was kind of a dead end. And my grandfather was getting mm-hmm. older, and uh, I was actually the way it all started was we were we were deer hunting, bow hunting for deer a lot. That's what my dad's main thing right. was. He didn't really care about the dog stuff. Glee- and I was scared of the dark. To make a really long story short. I was petrified of the dark. And I remember one time dad telling me, he said, you ought to start coon hunting so that you could be get comfortable out at night. And it, it, he probably doesn't even remember saying that, but it planted a seed in me. And my best friend's family were coon hunters. And uh, we started, the first time I went coon hunting, I was in the ninth grade. And I went with a guy that had two blue ticks, uh, Teresa and Trooper. We went out in big national forest in western Arkansas where I lived. And it was just exciting to be out at night. It was a it was a group event. You know, I'd mainly done solo bow hunting or mm-hmm. just quail hunting with my grandfather. And here we were with uh you know, four or five people and we were it was just a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And I remember they cut those blue ticks loose and I, re- I I couldn't take you to the spot. I could probably get you within two miles of it where it happened. Mm-hmm. But I can I could draw a picture, a painting of where they treed that night. 
and they treed right on top of just kind of a pinnacle mountain down in the Washtals that fell off on in every direction and right on top of that little mountain they treed and man he shot that coon out of that tree and and those it was like anything I'd ever seen and I mean I was hooked I loved it I just I, it was just something new really? I was 14 yeah and uh and I hunted with them for prob for that winter Teresa and Trooper and uh, Mike Vest was the guy's name no 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 not Mike Vest Mike Parks his his dad's name was Vest Vest Parks was mm-hmm. and uh within 6 months my best friend's dad instigated us buying a pair of blue tick coon hounds yeah and uh we drove an hour and a half and looked in the arkansas democrat gazette found a you know six week old registered blue tick coon hound pups for sale called the number guy said yeah i've got some pups we went over there we came home with two macy and maddie and uh and hunted them for they were the first first coon dogs i had so brent got his pup off a of facebook marketplace and you got yours off of the, the 1990s wanted. Wanted. facebook page yeah <laughs> marketplace. i think it was 90, 1994 there's yeah. actually a picture of me in full cry magazine oh. uh in it's sometime between 94 and 96 with with uh my second pup that i got that i How progressed did, what, to what was the context behind your picture i, being I, in I sent it in it's just like in the reader's photos you I know got you yeah, in the reader's <laughs> photos. Really cool. Do you have the issue or anything? Man, I used to. But I wonder if I wonder if Danny or Jason Doobie uh, could get us. I told Jason. I bet they could. I, I can't pin down which one it is, but I uh, I just I was so proud of this little pup, and it, it wasn't those pups. It was the second blue tick I got because I yeah. I hunted those dogs and and they didn't they didn't turn out real good. And me and my best friend, I, I learned real quick about houndsmen. Me and my best friend like split up like big time. <laughs> we had a fracture in our relationship because we were partners on these blue ticks, and they just weren't turning out that good. And so about a year and a half in, I was like, "Buddy, I'm out." <laughs> and, and oh, for real, he wouldn't talk to me for a long time. Really? <laughs> and we finally him, made up. Uh, yeah, it was a big deal because I I handled it wrong. His dad. My best friend's dad, actually, he handled me really well. He actually called me out one night out of the house, and he said, Clay, I want to talk to you. And basically he said, I don't think you really handled this the right way uh, because I just was like, these dogs are not what I want. I want out. I want y'all to buy me out. I mean, I just didn't have a – it was just a kid, stupid yeah. kid. And he, he was seasoned, and he was like, this is probably how you should have done it. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Well, listen. Anyway, uh, yeah, life lessons just came flooding in with the dogs. You know, partnership on dogs is rough. Yeah. Man, yeah. that is a rough deal. I've done it a few times. It's only worked out. I've done it more than a few times. It's only wor- worked out a couple times. Yeah. That that Walker dog I was telling you about, I bought that dog. I actually took out a loan to buy that dog in 1992 wow yeah mm. and i did couldn't come up with all of it and i didn't want to borrow all of it so i talked a buddy of mine into going into and and the two of us grounds up enough money to do that i mean you talk about st- stupid <laughs> you, know? you talk about not handling things right taking a loan out to buy a dog is not the smart Probably not thing the best to do. thing to do yeah. you know and so when I was I was actually a conservation officer at the time, I was getting reassigned. I was going to move. I didn't want to give up the dog. I bought my buddy out, and that one worked out. Todd and I are still, you know, we're still friends. I haven't seen him for a long time, but, you know, we call each other up and, and roll. And then the other one was the partnership I had with Donnie Walston on Big Country. It was just very, very – we knew each – we knew our roles, and we didn't get out of yeah, our lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but Donnie had the final say on, on everything. And I was good with that. Yeah. So, but it's, it's treacherous. When yeah. Partnerships are good. If everything is ironed out at the beginning, if everybody knows what their role is to play and yeah. you can, you can go with that. But what you two clowns play, <laughs> <laughs> we're doing, that was doomed from the get go. Well, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was. Yeah. So w- both of you 
in pot in your podcast country life this country life and the bear grease podcast you guys talk a lot about hounds and you know that life what is it about hounds that made an impression on you clay to keep going back to that well and and talking yeah. about that what is yeah it? i didn't i didn't realize what uh yeah uh, what a vat a, a well of resource that it was for me to have had early history with hounds because i don't know that i would have got into it if i hadn't when i was young i was it was i was very impressionable that that period of time in a young man's life you know 14 15 16 years old just a lot of what you're exposed to during that time sticks even if you don't see the immediate fruits of it because what happened with me is i had those initial two dogs that i got out of Mm -hmm. i had one other dog that i kind of raised to completion who was a coon dog but not a not a great dog at all but you we killed coons with it sure and then i had i got another uh blue tick directly out of uh northern blue levi okay one of the world was ron taylor not? yeah ron taylor's dogs up. um He's crooked creek crooked creek an old man named jackson over in harrison uh, had a Crooked Creek line of blue ticks that mm -hmm. they advertised in full cry all the time. He had crossed with Northern Blue Levi, and I got a pup out of them. And then I went to college. So it was only it was a short span of time, right. about five years. I hunted as serious as I knew how, which I didn't know a thing. But we just went, and I really took it on as something I enjoyed. And when I went to college. I, I couldn't hunt, and basically my first year of college, I got out of dogs. Um, and then when I had a family, my kids were young. We got a blue tick about 2004 that was uh, also out of the northern blue Levi line mm -hmm. and never hunted that dog, just kind of had it as a pet for a while. Two years later, a buddy of mine gave me a cull coon dog named Cheater. That he he was a real serious competition man, and he he had a dog that wouldn't hunt. It, he said it was a good tree dog, but it just didn't have the drive. And he gave it to our family, and uh, we had Cheater for several years. What kind of dog was Cheater? Blue, registered blue tick, and um, Cheater would go out from the house here and tree coons, and Cheater ended up getting stolen. So that was 2004, and then I didn't have dogs again until about 2000. It was about an eight or nine year gap, mm -hmm. and that's when I got into plots. Right. Uh, and uh, so to answer your question, what was it about it? I mean, it's just this. You know, hunting with hounds is 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 just such a primitive thing, and I'm attracted to things that are that I think are foundational inside the hunting space. And, mm -hmm. You know, partnering with a dog is about as old as it gets oh, in yeah. terms of primitive things that people can do. And uh, the oldest, the oldest documentation of hunting, we said this a thousand times on this podcast, is a, a cave wall drawing mm -hmm. of a man with a dog hunting. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's primitive. It goes way back. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's the stuff that's tapping inside of me when i when i hunt with a dog and i've always loved coon hunting because i remember thinking this when i was a kid too somehow i was already thinking ahead but i thought if i have a job and a family i'm gonna be busy during the day but i bet i could do something at night yeah i really thought that when i was like 15 years old right i think my dad had planted things in my mind like you gotta be you gotta watch your hobbies you gotta keep your life balanced and i thought i can coon hunt when everybody's asleep yeah yeah there and you go. to this day that's that's a thing i mean like so many I, the most that i've hunted in my life was basically a, a, it was about a five-year stretch when i was hunting my good plot female that we hunted a lot for, yeah. for me i hunted a lot in the yeah. winter mm -hmm. uh, you know for about four or five months i hunted a lot and, man, so many nights I would be leaving my house at 8 or 9 o'clock after I'd kind of done stuff with the family or done whatever I needed to do. And I would think, man, about everybody I know is bedding down probably in front of the TV to watch Netflix right now. And here I am out having the friends. adventure of my life. Yeah, I mean, that's the way I thought about it 
um, and I felt like I was I was I was stealing from this this place that people didn't have access to. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like in my life, it's, it's like I'm just looking for places to to to, to find enjoyment, to find pleasure, pleasure yeah. coon hunting, to to find excitement. And man, going out at night with a dog is just exciting. You never and, uh, know what's going to happen. Yeah. So I I really enjoyed it. And it uh, last December, so I guess it's coming up on a year, uh, my female died and uh, kind of been in the hunt for a coon dog since then. Mm-hmm. But I got to be honest, though, since I'm on the Houndsman XP podcast, I don't want to sound like a hero. I've kind of enjoyed not having a dog. <laughs> a <little bit. laughs> this one is hot off the press, folks, literally. It's a print magazine designed for houndsmen. It's the original tree dog publication. Full Cry will be back in circulation in October. I can't wait. I grew up on Full Cry magazine. I used to take those issues and scour through every page. And the photos of houndsmen doing hound dog stuff was just epic. I mean, it molded me and shaped me as a houndsman from a young age. You can get your subscription to Full Cry Magazine when you join us on Patreon. That is going to be a benefit that we are going to offer to all of our Patreon supporters in collaboration with Full Cry Magazine. So you can join us on Patreon by going to houndsmanxp.com, clicking on the Support Us tab, and it will take you straight to our Patreon page. That also includes Tailgate Talks, which are like many podcasts every week that, that Seth is pumping out there. There's articles, there's videos, there's uh, benefits for the Sportsman's Alliance. There's tons of discount codes for all of our vendors. You can check it all out at houndsmanxp.com. There's you know, a lot of pressure when you have dogs. Yeah. And if I don't hunt mine, you know, I walk if if I go if I get busy doing other stuff, I start feeling guilty. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. it's an obligation. And I've found, you know, God bless Roy Clark. I know he's got a ton of dogs, but I can't walk past dogs and not take them hunting. It's hard on me. Yeah. You know, and I know they're hunting every day and there's a different reason for that, but but for me with coon dogs and things like that and it's hard but i even have to get my bear dogs out and and just take them out and hunt them and it's not coon hunting i'm telling you that right now (laughs) they're not coon dogs i don't have a coon dog to my name right now but uh there's an obligation you feel this sense of obligation to them to to get them out there and let them do the things that they want to do but you know there's been tons of people that have been exposed to coon hunting at the same age as you were that didn't do it they they didn't pick it up so what's your thought i mean why is that brent man as far as like my history of of staying with it for so long it it was just so ingrained in in me yeah you know and i got two two older brothers and one of them could care less about it and and my oldest brother tim who i talk about a lot hunting with he enjoys it but not to the point of having a coon dog now he's got tree dogs yeah you know squirrel dogs and stuff but there's in my family, it was hunting dogs, some one one type of dog, or not exactly one type of dog, but a dog that it was utilitarian that was serving right. a purpose. Right. It was either bringing groceries on the table, or it was herding cows. You know, it was providing a function. Mm-hmm. I've got an old picture in the fifties of my great grandfather holding an eight point buck in a pair of overalls with a pocket watch just like you got right here and in the background is laying is a tree and walker coon dog laying back there and it's one of my most favorite photographs the deer's in the overalls the deer was not wearing the overalls <laughs> <laughs> but but he had of, the pocket watch he had the pocket watch okay got it, got it. <laughs> but the it says to, to me that that whole that description right there and you can see the you can see an old picket fence where our my great grandfather's house was right there in that photograph. And to me that says so much about my family. It was we lived close to the earth. We liked simple things. Mm-hmm. He was providing he was having fun. He shot him a buck deer in the fifties. There probably wasn't a whole bunch of them around Arkansas during that time. And that coon dog was laying in the back 
and uh, was it a coon dog or was it a deer dog? No, it was a coon dog. Okay, I got mm-hmm. you. Yeah, it was a coon dog laying back there, and it just that never that passion never left my family. I, I've got four brothers, and and I'm the only one that the bug bit. They've all been. I've taken every one of them, but. Did your folks? Did your did you grow up in it, doing it as a kid? No, no, my my folks didn't. My uncle did. Uh, my grandfather, my great my great grandfather was an outdoorsman. Bird dogs, you know. Mm-hmm. I remember my earliest memories are bird dogs and and quail and things like that. But uh, uh, I've told the story a bunch before, but you know it's through my uncle and and there was just something about those hounds that just piqued my interest. I remember flipping through I I might have been a weird kid, but I I we had the it's, whole collection it's likely. Of, yeah. <laughs> we all were. can we vote on that? Yeah. <laughs> the Foxfire books. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, you flip through the Foxfire books, the originals, and I remember those pictures of of Gola Ferguson and and you know, some of those old timers in there from Appalachia, that just reeled me in. Mm-hmm. It just, something about it reeled me in. And I just kept kept at it all those mm-hmm. years until I, I finally got my own dog at about the age, of, it was right at the age of 13. Mm-hmm. And there's been a few years there where I didn't have, have dogs due to life and military service and things like that. But, yeah, yeah. And, but I remember being in college. We were, I didn't have a hound when I was in college. And we were out scouting a place to deer hunt. And I heard some dogs running back on Busseron Creek. <laughs> and it was a public hunting area called Minnehaha in west central Indiana. <laughs> and me and a buddy of mine. We're we just, just going to slide right over that name, I guess. <laughs> Minnehaha. <laughs> yeah, Minnehaha. Sounds like a joke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a small one. A little one. <laughs> it's, a little <laughs> joke. it's a little joke. But uh, anyway, I heard those hounds running. And this buddy of mine was with me, and I made him trudge all the way back through there to go see what those hounds were doing. And we found them running up the creek right there. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, what were, were they running? They were just out during the day. They were right down on the creek bank. I imagine they they were young dogs. Just I'm doing sure, the thing. I'm Trashing. sure some houndsmen, probably. <laughs> sure, I'm sure that some houndsmen was just letting their young dogs run. Yeah. You know, like we – that's the best way to raise one, in my opinion, is let them yeah. – find out their purpose in life yeah. on their own until they do start trash and then get them up yeah but uh yeah it was just amazing i mean i walked all the way back there through that through that area and through all kinds of briar thickets and stuff just to see what those dogs were into man you're answering that genetic code that's uh, in you that's what you were doing yeah that's been ingrained in us since we started hunting dogs fifteen thousand years ago i think i think there's something to it but not everybody gets it not mm-hmm. everybody i mean my brothers are like what are you doing? Why? <laughs> my parent, my dad was like that. He's like, I don't understand this at all. <laughs> you know, yeah. He's yeah. a bird dog guy, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, but I think there's something to that, that, that it hits some people, you know, not all of us can be the little Billy from where the red fern grows that saves up pop bottle money and walks and hitchhikes and carries home puppies in a sack yeah all the way to mm-hmm. Tahlequah yeah <laughs> all the way all the way yeah what a journey yep but so Brent mm-hmm. let's get back to that running dog deal because that's something we talk about not enough but something that totally intrigues me yeah the whole running dog scene is something that uh, a lot of big game houndsmen are are starting to add more running dog into the treeing dog side of it for, for track speeds. And some of the Southern people have been doing it for years, but it's starting to gain more traction outside of that. So, you know, what was your grandpa's history with the, well, it, it, or was my, it your dad? My dad. Your yeah. dad. I'm my sorry. dad's history. Yeah. He, it was, uh, from the time he was a young man, I'm talking like, you know, when his late teens, early twenties, that's when he started getting running dogs. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a big, a cultural community thing down there in that part of Arkansas where I was raised. Folks had hunting dogs. They had bird dogs. They had tree dogs. And they had running dogs. And they'd run deer, coyotes, and then they'd have dogs that would tree squirrels and coons and then and point birds. 
and that that was the dogs that we had there and and you know herd dogs collie dogs to to move mm-hmm. cattle around but his his whole deal was was running was walker dogs was running coyotes and they called it you know they called it fox hunting wolf hunting that right. was the that was the colloquial names of it, but I mean they were they were chasing coyotes, what they yeah the old Texas guys used to they still call themselves wolf hunters yeah mm-hmm. and matter of fact my dad's CB handle was the curly wolf that was no kidding yeah that, that <laughs> the curly wolf yeah and his hair wasn't curly at all <laughs> but uh, they didn't want to run fox because the fox just made little loops like a rabbit you know they didn't run far they wanted to stretch a coyote out and and hear those dogs cover some country. And the part of the fun was keeping up with them. Mm-hmm. You know, and there wasn't no GPSs. There wasn't all the GPS was in my dad's head. And my dad probably knew that part of Arkansas and those river bottoms where we grew up as well as anybody. And he'd say, okay, them dogs are headed towards Little Lake. We need to hit the lower potlatch road. And we'd be two, a mile, two miles from there. And we'd jump in the truck. Man, it was the Dukes of Hazard. Yeah, turned driving into a moon, down the road. Turned into a moonshine ride. Ex- absolutely, yeah. and get down there and cut them off, and we'd slide to a stop and jump out of the truck, and boy, here they come, just to- <laughs> yes, sand in the rail. And the deal was, you know, and it was so just the opposite of coon hunting for me. It was all the dogs need to be together because whoever's in front, that's the guy that's getting all the glory, you know. And yeah, they, they're they're wanting a faster dog, a faster dog. And they want them all to be together. Everybody's in the race. And then you swap over to coon hunting. And if your dog is going left, I want mine going right. I don't yeah. want him following yours around. So yeah. it, it was two sides of the coin there that, that I grew up looking at. But having the the coyote hunting was, was so much fun to me because we could sit in one spot and build a fire. And we sat there and talk. And I would be... 10 11 12 and up till i was 16 you didn't cook any hot dogs or anything did you uh, 10 tons of them (laughs) (laughs) and then we and there'd be all my dad's buddies around you know and i was i was getting education i so i i never met brent's dad they they called him buddy but i feel like i have just through brent and all the different stories but this last spring we went and spent some time with it's a it's a long story but uh a friend, a family friend that was Buddy's friend yeah. that's now Brent's friend. Anyway, I kind of saw who Buddy was through the eyes of this guy I'd never met before. Mm-hmm. And basically, Buddy was just like the classic ringleader, you know, of, 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 of this crew of running dog men, just well respected everybody loved him big character big fun had good dogs you know everybody he all the boxes everybody the that, you know he was just like the the classic ring leader mm-hmm. that, that's the way i interpreted it i have 100 percent. and no. they and, and because toby is our buddy toby toby niemeyer and toby niemeyer up in central missouri he 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 had story after story about about Buddy Reeves, and you know, and because Buddy would go to Central Missouri to run dogs with them. Yeah, they'd hunt up and there, then, and Toby'd come down there and hunt yeah, with yeah. us. And Toby to this day is a big running dog man. Yep, and got some. He got two good coon dogs it, too. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, it's funny you said about them mixing running dogs in with bear. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, can I talk about Toby's dogs? Oh yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, all the bear dog guys are doing. Um, you know, Shorty's running running dogs on on lions out there in New Mexico. Yeah, and doing lion studies with those those running dogs. Yeah, I've seen some Mike stuff. Mike Kemp has been doing it up. up in Northwest and shipping dogs out. You know, really? Yeah. Well, he was saying he had done some bear hunting with yep. his running dogs from Missouri, and they and went to Wisconsin. Was it Wisconsin? I think so. Yeah. And and those guys were real impressed with the stamina of those running dogs and their speed. Yeah. And they were wanting to. They were like, "Hey, we want to get some of that." That was interesting. That is something. That's what's piquing my interest, you know. Yeah. Because when you listen, Heath did a podcast a few weeks ago. Yeah. With a July hunt, guy that hunted Julys, and he talked about these dogs running 150 miles in three days. Wow. You know, just having incredible stamina. Yes, and so you look at that. That's not just conditioning. That is selective breeding for, for that stamina, oh, for yeah. foot, for bone structure. 
you know, yeah, for yeah, all yeah. that stuff that that you have to accomplish to get in to that kind of a performance in a dog, and and I don't see that happening in um, that kind of concentrated breeding for you know competition coon hunting. You know, you got to be able to hunt two rounds a night, and and you know, I mean, it's not it's not a piece of cake or everybody be doing it right. Right. But but when you're talking about that kind of stamina that's a whole different level yeah, of kind yeah. Of stuff. that's way up there so yeah. when you're talking big game hounds that's one of the things you're looking at is looking for those dogs that you can run day after day after day multiple days in a row and and have the you know the foot composition foot toughness joints you know the whole nine yards all they've got to be incredible athletes yeah i mean clay think about when you and i were with straight sedio out in new mexico on those, we were out there what six days, mm -hmm. five six days, lion, uh, bear hunting every day, and man, we hit. We were on mules and we were riding, you know, everywhere from fourteen to seventeen miles a day on the yep. mules. Yep. You can times that by three yep. what those dogs were covering, and we did it every day. Yep. And it don't take long to add it up. It, mm -hmm. I mean, we put on twenty three miles, thirty miles on a dog, easy on on you know out there with shorty yeah you know when i bobcat hunt with him you reset the garment at the end of the night you got 25 miles on a dog yeah yeah i can coon hunt a lot of nights and unless i've got a bunch of trashy dogs i'm not running <laughs> 25 miles if i'm night. walking 25 miles i better be something's after me i'm, I'm <laughs> being chased yeah <laughs> yeah but so Let's switch gears a little bit because I want to talk about your podcast and the successes you guys have had with Bear Grease and This Country Life because I I have tried to set my show up to, to inform people what is so important about the narrative and telling stories. And you guys are doing – podcasts that are i mean your show every week is like i'm going to talk about this but first i'm going to tell you a story that's how you start yours brand mm -hmm. yeah every podcast you do is a story and you've risen to the top of the game with your storytelling and the way you put these shows together why did you pursue that clay why did mm. you set up your podcast to tell that story what kind of values does it bring to the hunters in the outdoor world you know, I, I think like a lot, it's probably like a lot of stories of something that became successful is that when it started, you didn't really think it would be. You know, I mean, it, it it's not like from the very beginning we knew that this was going to work as well as it has. Right. Um, but, and I never honestly considered myself a storyteller. I, I'm not saying that to sound contrite it's just the truth you remember that podcast we did that was supposed to be about storytelling oh yeah yeah and yeah, we yeah. all fumbled all over ourselves and didn't tell a good story the whole time <laughs> i mean we stole some <laughs> decent stories but yeah. then here you come and boom you're telling these magnificent stories but there's a value in that story yeah well I, I mean the 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 baseline of human human communication outside of hunting or anything is is our stories carry our values and and people whether we think we do or we don't the humans love stories i mean e everything is carried by a story i mean and uh you know at, at bear grease we just started telling these stories in a documentary style which was a kind of a a unique style for a podcast mm -hmm. and which basically means we have We'll have a topic, and we'll have multiple guests. And I might interview somebody. On any given Bear Grease, I've interviewed at, le at least two people for probably an hour and a half to two hours each. Mm -hmm. And and I will whittle that down into a, you know, a 55-minute podcast. And so you're, you're cherry-picking sure. the, the best parts of these conversations and then piecing them together with voiceover. And in and, and, and that method of storytelling, you're able to – really tell a complex story very efficiently there's no fluff right um and so it just it just it works but um um no i, I mean 
it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized how enamored with or, or in love with I was the the lifestyle that we live as American hunters. And I, I, I give so much credit to my dad who did, didn't do this on purpose, but my dad was a banker. You met my dad today. Yep. My, my dad was a banker. He in a small town in in western rural Arkansas, and they he banked f- fly, for the drug cartel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He, ba- he yeah, in, yeah, that's right. What's yeah. the name of the town? You beat me to it. Mina, Mina, Mina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amer- go watch the American Dream. <laughs> yeah, the original bank from Mina. Gary that, did all his own stunts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But he would. So he just met. He knew everybody in the community, and when he would come home at night, he wouldn't talk to me about the insurance agents and the car dealers and the and the pharmacists he talked to me about the the people that came in to borrow four hundred dollars so they could go catfishing for a week so they could buy he, a coon dog he he, he <laughs> talked to me about about the the rural people about the hunters I, so many times he would come home and he'd be like clay we're gonna go see so and so I met this guy today, and he killed a big buck. I can't tell you how many times he took me out somewhere. You know, I couldn't take you back to the places, and we'd open up some freezer and pull out a big buck head and put it on the table, and some old man would tell us the story. And, you know, Dad wouldn't have known, and neither would I, how impacting all that was to me. But right. but Dad was great at asking questions, and, and he he – he was teaching me to be an anthropologist, yeah, you know, in a way, and uh, and then when I got older and got into outdoor media, honestly, I thought that the stories that I was interested in were not mainstream stories. I mean, I, I, really, when I started working for media three years ago, was the first time that I, I kind of was like, oh. Maybe people are interested in this. I mean, I felt like the stuff I was interested in was just obscure. Well, I think that's because we live it, you know. So it's like you think it is. Well, I mean, narrow market. Nobody was. Nobody was. I mean, mainstream hunting stories were kill a big whitetail in Kansas, kill a turkey, right? uh, You know, just kind of these mainstream things that I'm very interested in, and people are very interested in. They were not as there was there was nobody telling on the main on the big platforms talking about the Roy Clarks. Right. They weren't talking about a, a mentor of mine named James Lawrence, whose picture's up on that wall, who's just a classic mountain deer hunter. You know, I mean, he, he he's, nobody's telling his story. Nobody's telling stories about Ori Province, this old man that lives out in the mountains over here that just didn't do anything real flashy, other than having an incredible life, an incredible story that, and, and so when we started telling these kind of obscure stories, I, I, I feel like people just were like, they connected with it, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and, and then we started diving in with historical characters. So if, if Bear Gre- if you could describe Bear Grease, we do some stories on living people like, uh, like Warner Glenn, yeah. which was a gem in the, a diamond in the rough, man, this right. old guy, um, you know, Warner's now I think eighty eight and big line hunter out west. A lot of the hound guys would have known yeah, him. We already, but we already knew who Warner is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, a lot of the bigger mainstream world outside of the hound community wouldn't have known Warner. But they do now. And and it's just a fascinating story. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we tell we talk about some people that are still alive, but we also started diving into these historical things that I didn't think would work very good. To be honest with you, the first one we did was on Daniel Boone. And I remember, if you go back and listen to the intro of the first Daniel Boone podcast I did on Bear Grease, almost like I qualified it. I was like, now, guys, this is a little different than the other ones. You're going to have to put your thinking caps on for this, and it's going to be kind of like sitting through history class. But trust me, there's going to be some payoff. You're going to like this if you just sit here. I mean, I was worried about it. I was like, golly, this is a lot of history, a lot of deep dive. And that Daniel Boone three-part series ended up being one of our most listened to. I mean, to this mm-hmm. day, people talk to me about the Daniel Boone series. Yeah. So we learned something from that. We we're like, oh, yeah, we can go back and tap into these deep, deep cultural ties that we have that nobody's 
I'm not people have explored it massively, but have not been explored on this platform a podcast. I right. mean, it, uh, in in this fashion. And so you know, we we started doing stuff. We did Daniel Boone. We did Hulk Collier. You know, the market mm-hmm. bear hunter down in Mississippi. We did uh, Davy Crockett. We did Lewis Wetzel. We've done Tecumseh. Right. We've done uh, who else have we done? We, we all these historical things that ended up being really neat. And uh, so we've just had a lot of fun with it. I mean, yeah. I, I I don't talk about anything that I'm not very passionate about. Right. That, that's rule number one. People all the time give me great ideas for Bear Grease podcasts mm-hmm. every day. Give me great ideas, and I read it, and I'm like, man, you nailed it. That'd be great. Minus one thing, I'm just not that <laughs> interested in it today. And and I may be a year from now or three months from now. Um and uh. But I, I've learned so much. It's been so developmental for me to have it be my job that's to one, go do this. That's one of my biggest rewards of producing podcasts because we did it yeah. the same reason. You know, I, I started this podcast because nobody was talking about this in mainstream hunting. Yeah. Nobody. And our story needed to be told because when you don't tell your story, then somebody else tells it for you. Yeah. Yeah. And more than likely, they're going to get it wrong. Or they're going to use it against you. And so that's why Houndsman XP was started. But, Brent, what is what is your thoughts on and your reason and the value of stories? Clay was probably the first person that really brought it to my attention about the stories that I tell. Mm-hmm. And, and there was no mission behind it. We'd just be, we'd be going somewhere. And we we traveled all over the United States and drove to Canada. I don't know how many times. It seems like way too many. <laughs> Instead of flying, because we could we could take all the stuff we needed right. with us in a truck, and so we're just talking. And there's only so many things you can talk about, but we he we have a conversation about anything, crayons, and it would remind me of something. It may be totally opposite. It may have been off. A dog my dad had named Crayon, right. or it may have been my brother eating crayons. Right, he wasn't in the Marine Corps. No, I was going to ask you if he was a Marine. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but he would get to the point where he'd say, "Man, you have a story for everything," and I'm like, uh, "I can't do math, <laughs> but I can tell a story." <laughs> and I've had a good buddy of mine, Jacob Wood, I hunt with a lot, and he'd say. He'd tell me a story, and I'd say, oh, that reminds me of something. And I'd tell him, he said, man, you're a one-upper. You're a one-upper <laughs> storyteller. I'm like, no, I'm not. I just I just thought about this, and I, I wanted to tell you this thing. So, th- and ever since this whole the podcast thing started, and when Clay said, man, you, you ought to do a podcast. You should do this, and we should come up with some type of format for you to, to mm-hmm. do. And... I said, well, man, I don't really know a whole heck of a lot other than I know policing, and I don't want to talk about that. Right. I don't, I'm through talking about that. He said, what else do you know? And I said, well, I know, you know, I know some stuff about hunting, but I like, I know about living in the country because that's all I've ever done, you know. And that part of that was my upbringing was when, this was before PlayStations, before all that stuff, when Anytime we had a family gathering, everybody would be playing football in the yard, running here, running there. I'd be sitting on the porch with the old folks because they were talking about coon dogs and they were talking about shooting deer and they were talking about all the and trapping. Mm-hmm. They were talking about the things. And that's a lot of these stories and stuff that I tell. Is that's where I heard them, at the feet of the folks that told them. And it was just – a very important part of my upbringing and clay would say man you just you just tell those stories you know it's kind of a a unique skill set and i don't see it that way i think it is a misspent youth i should have been studying <laughs> algebra yeah. instead of sitting <laughs> no at doubt. the foot of my grandfather and my dad and all those folks that were and my uncles and listen to them tell stories that i probably shouldn't have been listening to but it ingrained in me a, a way to tell a story. I think. Do you ever were you ever sitting there and they look down at you and say, 
Brent, you need to go play. <laughs> <laughs> you, you no, to they've play. told me I need to <laughs> shut up before. <laughs> yeah. But they they didn't. They never run me off. And it was never really, you know, it was never anything bad. But they uh, they included me in that. Yeah. And because they, cause they took me with them. You know, I was there. You know, I may have been there the day that, mm-hmm. that Peanut Tree two squirrels and a coon in the same tree or, or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And I could see the value and stuff that they put into it because they got great joy of telling folks that, that hadn't heard that story. So when we when the idea came up to do this, Alexis, my wife Alexis and Clay's wife Misty, we went out to eat supper. Mm-hmm. And we went to Herman's Steakhouse in Fayetteville. And we sit down and eat supper. And I said, well, hey, let's talk about this idea that you had about this podcast. And we – Clay, Misty, and Alexis and I pretty well. They three really kind of hammered out the format for it right there at that supper table, and we turned it in. And that's what and and what it is now compared to what we planned it to be. I'd say it's probably ninety percent of what uh, we thought. Yeah, it's pretty close. It's I mean almost verbatim what we do. Uh, we the only thing we changed was uh, it, it was just me doing a monologue instead of talking to somebody. Right, and. It has really caught on and really done really well. Yeah. yeah Brent is uh, – so, yeah, I met Brent because he was my cameraman. You know, he was sure. he was working yeah. to – he volunteered to help me film when I had Bear Hunting Magazine mm-hmm. and didn't have any money to pay a cameraman. Brent was like, I'll help you. And so Brent used was coming not, along with I'm me. I'm used to not making any money. He was coming along with me, and it took me a couple of years to realize I was like, this guy's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Really, I'm telling you, Brent has a <laughs> brilliant ability to remember stories, which mm-hmm. which is a thing. Like there, you know, there's some people that can remember stuff. Yeah. Not only that, he has a he had the ability and kind of the desire and just natural inclination to repeat those stories in an entertaining way. Yes. And it, the. the I mean, th- there was a while when I thought Brent was just full of it because I was like, there is no way that somebody's got this many stories. But I, I they- can't remember the, one of the most famous tree and <laughs> walker dogs of all time is the grandfather to my dog at home, but I can remember all that. Story. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, be- I'm kind of joking, but I'm being serious. Like, I don't have uh, – Brent just has a, a, a real ability to remember stories, but sure. that's not even it because – what makes this country life so good is that Brent is a phenomenal writer, like actual writer. Ah, oh. that that so there's a unique combination of some some brilliance, some genuine country living that he was he was baptized in from mm-hmm. birth, not from his choosing, to being raised by Buddy Reeves, who was just a real iconic Arkansas rural guy, and then Brent being ignorant enough. <laughs> To uh, <laughs> to not go do something and be uh, you know Brent could have been a he could have been the president of a bank he chose not to do that he wasted his life out in the country <laughs> and uh, that's a joke that's a joke Brent no it's, and you're pretty it, it was a it was a it was a unique combination that here and I think it's so cool because Jerry Clower was 55 years old when he kind of became well known yes. and started his comedy career Brent's kind of like that. I mean, it, it's like, you know, Brent's 57 mm-hmm. and never had any intentions of being – I think he wanted to be in outdoor media just like a lot of people would have, but never, you know, it's like never really a dream or never really something that could be realized. And uh, just the right circumstances came about. But more than just right circumstances, he had the skill set to whoosh, put all this together. Because I know 100 people that can tell a great story – but they 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 don't quite have the they're just not quite able to do what Brent's doing and I his agree. podcast is doing really good. You know, you, you you look at the storytelling art, and I I I think there is an art to it, um, and I haven't ever broken it down. I just watch successful storytellers. You mentioned Jerry Clower. You know, obviously there was a lot of comedy there. Brent tells a great story we haven't even tapped into the music trivia knowledge he has uh, <laughs> and and things like that but but people have to have that desire i think it's something that taps into who we are in our character 
because there are certain people that can remember names and places and dates and things like that because they're paying attention. They're not worried about themselves. They're worried about – they're thinking about this person they just met. Mm. And so they put their value – on other people and they put their value on the experience of what they're experiencing through other people. They're not worried about what they, uh, I don't want to say what they accomplish, but, but how they're contributing to the story. They're, they're watching it all around them and taking it all in and, and then being able to take those facts. I mean, you can write a police report and be a Joe Friday, mm. just the facts, <laughs> ma'am. Yeah. You know, Joe Friday was extremely boring, but, you can take that same story and put some color to it and make people feel like that they're part of it. And that's a unique skill. Mm -hmm. But I think that I, the reason I keep tapping into it about the values of it is because I think we're losing that ability in our modern culture to be able to tell that story. You know, a Facebook story is 10 seconds long. And yeah, so we're, right. we're trying to be like, you know, cram it into a one-minute reel and a tell sound, a story. Yeah, sound bad. When, when historically storytelling has been huge, those verbal accounts that you, you read things like the, you know, from the Tecumseh. You mentioned Tecumseh. That was all oral history yeah. for the Shawnee people and tons of Native American tribes and the Israelites, and, and that was all oral history. And we as a culture – are losing that ability to tell that story. And I think with that, what we do is we devalue ourselves because it, like I said, if we don't tell our story and we don't know how to tell it, somebody else is going to tell it for us. Well, you look around, I mean, you look around at a, go, go out to eat with your family and sit at the table and while you eat, just look around the, how many folks that are sitting at a table, they're either waiting for their food or they're, they've already eaten and, There'll be five people at that table, and five of them are looking at their telephone. Oh yeah, instead of talking to one another. But and that that's where the storytelling. That's where it comes. I, I I wasn't looking at a phone, and I'm not saying that had I if I was growing up now, I wouldn't be doing the same thing. Right. But my exposure was if I'm if, if folks are talking, you respect their time and their and them well enough to listen to what they're saying, or get up and go. But you're not going to sit there and play solitaire while Uncle Joe's over here talking. You're going to pay attention to what he's saying, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's where you that makes you place value on listening. Yeah. And you can't tell a story without listening. I don't care who you are. You got to listen and and be able to relate to the folks you're talking to. That I mean, that's my opinion. I agree. I agree. I was listening to. Uh, I don't always listen to Jordan Jordan Peterson. I'm not giving like a full in, endorsement. I, I just don't listen to him enough. But I was listening to Jordan Peterson podcast the other day, and he he was talking about the power of story being like really the storytellers of a of a generation are the most powerful and influential people. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how um, you know like right now Hollywood is the storytelling capital of of america i mean mm -hmm. really when you think about it, i mean movies all this stuff it's stories they're storytellers and they control the narrative of the country even more than politics in a lot of ways sure. that, that was his point is that the storytellers have the power mm -hmm. inside of a culture to, to to shift it and to shape it that is not as hands-on as as political shaping of a of a of a society yeah, yeah people distrust politicians you know right. by nature you know you just you end up distrusting them and and things like that so your storytellers that come back and tell that story i agree 100 percent. they it, have the power it was almost like and it's, it's not word for word the way he said it but the way i understand it and interpreting it now is like he was like there's almost like two power bases inside of a society society a political power base in a, in a storytelling power base through the media. Mm -hmm. you well, the know, and it, it's like these two things. And, and I think what we're all doing inside of podcasters, uh, we're, we're storytellers. We're, we're carrying the values of our culture and, and defining it. We're, we're interpreting. You know, that, that's what I feel like I do. I think it's what Brent does. I think it's what you do, Chris, is that we're interpreting a value system to people 
putting words around it, articulating it, and giving people the words yes. that of, of things that they very well may believe. I want to teach people how to tell their story, the values of what they do, the values of hunting with hounds, the values they they add to the big picture wildlife management, the values they bring financially to the towns of of uh, you know Tyler, Missis or. Uh, is it Tyler? Where's the Winter Classic at? Batesville, Mississippi. Batesville, Mississippi. Richmond, Indiana. You know, the financial benefits there. But we've got to have – we've done a very – until recently, we've done a very poor job of telling our story mm -hmm. and and showing the rest of the world what values we bring. And, and until we understand how to tell that story, and it's not always with a grip and grin or, you know, you mentioned the, the dog – barking at a cage coon you mm -hmm. know that's not a story yeah. that's you know that's not who we are let's tell the stories that uh, the values we add and and take back control of the narrative there and then it's a lot harder to it's a lot harder to come after people when when people can put an identity to what you're doing and who you are oh 100 percent. yeah yep yep for sure for sure well cool man i've got to head on over west my trip's not over. I appreciate you guys taking time to sit down with us. and Thank you for inviting me. me, man. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, you guys got any final thoughts or closing remarks? Looking for a good plot female. Oh, you're, you're going to use my platform for that, too. Yep. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I blame you, man. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, Finally, yeah. You said. Few and far between. Yeah. Good plot female. Those three words don't go together very often, do they? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm really going to get in trouble on this platform saying stuff like that. Five years ago, Clay and I were coming back from somewhere, and he said, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. At that time, I only knew of one podcast. It was Joe Rogan's, and my son said, Dad, you should listen to a pod. You should listen to this podcast. What's a podcast? How do I watch a podcast? No idea. He said, we're driving down the road, and he says, I, man, I think I'm going to do a podcast. And in the same breath, he said, nah, everybody's doing those. I ain't going to do that. But if there was one human being that I know that was born to do a podcast, it's Claybo. Yep. You remember that conversation? No. Yeah. See, there you go. You remember it, and I don't. <laughs> There's a story. There's I'm going to add a lot to that. We yeah, also, yeah. We you also, can do whatever uh, you want with that story because I, I don't even remember it. We also robbed a liquor store. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast. We just dropped a really cool T-shirt, sweatshirt design over there. Yeah, 70% off. 75. <laughs> <laughs> we, we initiated a sale while you were out looking for your Jag Terrier. Yeah, I don't may, know, man. You may not have any left. <laughs> uh, no, it's the Joiner Die. The Joiner Die design. It's uh, uh, Check that out on our website at houndsmanxp.com. We're trying to do our part to raise money for the fight in Colorado on Initiative 91. Sale Tell you what, let's cancel that sale. Let's go full price on full that. Full price. Yeah, and yeah I'm, full price. I'm ordering <laughs> I'm ordering me one. Yeah. So we're gonna need we're gonna need all the resources, all hands on deck for that one, folks. So if you can spare a few dollars, then uh wear your colors proudly. Join or die on the Houndsman XP podcast. That website. escalated quickly. Join or die. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's uh the it's an urgent matter. So Yep. That's all I got for this week, folks. Appreciate you tuning in to the Hounds Next Beat podcast. This is Fair Chase. <laughs>